Well, hello again, and welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Rich. And as you can see on my screen, I entitled this podcast, Spiritually, Why Do I Do What I Do? And actually, this, uh, let me just get out of here, close this. I was inspired to do this podcast by something that I just republished on uh, uh, in a in a video format, and it was a writing. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of his name, Mark uh, uh, Freeze, and uh, he entitled his article. What I have found, my introduction to New Testament principles. I got it on my other screen here, so I can refer to it. But the reason that I'm making this podcast, and I'll probably end up having to do this in more than one podcast, because what I want to talk about is a lot of points that he makes in this article. Uh, But... When I first became a Christian, I really had a problem. I had a real bad taste in my mouth when it came to religious things and spiritual things. I came from a Catholic background. My mother was Catholic. My father had no religion at all. Uh, I believe he believed in, in the existence of a God, but uh, I think it was more like a higher power, uh, and uh, but he was not a churchgoer. In fact, when my mother and father got married, my dad had been married twice before, and because of this, uh, they would not marry my mother and father in the Catholic Church. In fact, they told my mother that if she married my father, that they would excommunicate her from the church, which they did. And the biggest problem was her family uh, looked down on her for many years. Uh, But that changed over time. Now, even though my mother's whole family was uh from poland my mother uh, or my grandmother didn't even speak english she spoke polish and i learned a little polish and she knew a little english so we could communicate when i was younger but my mother raised us in the catholic church and uh you know we went through all the sacraments and uh but I always kind of looked down on the church for excommunicating my mother. Even though my mother was faithful to the church, the church was not faithful to my mother. And my dad died three months prior to my mother dying. And we knew my mother was dying. She was down to about 80 pounds. And um, I was taking care of her the night she died. And uh, just prior to her death, her sisters came over there with a priest and they accepted my mother back into the church. So I had this real bad taste in my mouth about the Catholic Church. I was very bitter towards them. This um, was not good. But when I gave my life to the Lord and I became a Christian, I had to rethink uh, some of my thoughts uh, about the church. And I always looked at the Catholic Church as the church, the real church. But after I got saved, my thoughts changed. Uh, 
So it was going to be hard for me to join the church. But lucky enough, the people that were uh, instrumental in my salvation were not what you would call typical church goers. They met in a house. And it was pretty basically one family. Uh, so I kind of joined them uh, for worship. And we just met in this house and we set a loaf of bread and a cup of juice on the table. And we met around the Lord. And uh, they were holding to uh, New Testament principles of gathering. So I was introduced to this type of a meeting. And to me, it wasn't like church at all. But as time went on, there was more people saved and the church was growing in numbers and meeting around the Lord in a home, we'd fill up a home. <laughs> there was quite a few of us. So we decided to rent a, uh, a place so we could meet on Sunday morning. We still had Bible studies in the homes and stuff, but we started meeting in a place called the Upper Room. <laughs> very, very biblical. It was above the American Legion in a small town that I lived in. So every Sunday we would gather in the Upper Room. Well, my children were smaller then, so I started taking them to the gathering. My wife was not a Christian at the time. So uh, she wasn't going, but I kept taking the children. And it was around Christmas time and we were gonna have, you know, the kids were gonna have a Christmas uh, play. So uh, my youngest boy was real excited because he was gonna play the part of a wise wise men, but he said, he come home and told his mother he was going to uh, play the part of a wise guy. <laughs> so we kind of laughed about it, but I invited my wife to come to see the kids in the play, which she did. And uh, those that were gathering uh, around the Lord that Sunday, really welcomed to my wife. Oh, they just really made her feel welcome and she felt comfortable. And that's something my wife didn't think she would do. So she started coming out once in a while with me and the kids after that. And then we had gospel meetings. Uh, and at that time it was in the library which we were allowed to do back then, but we don't anymore because it's a public uh, government thing, you know. So we don't have uh, our gospel meetings at the library anymore. So my wife went to one of the gospel meetings and while uh, the message was being given, she was convicted of her sin and she came to the Lord and gave her life to the Lord. Same as what I did. She became a Christian and then she started meeting with us. Well, that's part of the, the, the story I want to share. But after reading this article, and it was kind of an introduction to the New Testament principles. This fella that wrote the article came from a completely different background. I mean, I was, I was a hell raiser. I wasn't a churchgoer anymore. 
but he was a pastor. I was totally the opposite. I was a non church goer. But spiritually, why do I do what I do? And it's based on the Bible. That's the only guide I use in my life now is what does the Bible say in every aspect of life? It, it has an answer. Well, let me just share the first part of it. It says, now this is the, the writer, not, this is not my uh, thoughts, but it's his thoughts, but they're very close to what I believe. It is my privilege to introduce the readers to the assemblies of Christian believers attempting to gather according to the pattern found in the New Testament. I write with hesitation for my last desire is to uh, exalt man or any group of men. Nevertheless, I feel compelled to share with others the blessings I myself receive from fellowship with the dear company of God's people. That is why I am doing this podcast. I want to introduce you to what blessings I received when I became a Christian. And it, it, it wasn't just the fact that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but I had a purpose in life. Back then I was just 40 years old, 41, I don't, it's pretty close. And I'm in my 80s now. So I've been doing this for as long as I was a non-believer than I am a believer right now. Half my life was non-Christian, the other half was being a Christian, much better being a Christian. When I got saved, uh, I was on the road to destruction, self-destruction. My life was filled with sin. I drank, I was wild, I ran around, I did violent things. But God stopped my mad career, stopped me dead in my tracks. I was in the kingdom of Satan, kingdom of darkness, and he transferred me from that kingdom to his kingdom. Well, he goes on to write, for six years, I pastored a church in a major denomination, having also been born... Uh, Brought to Christ, brought to Christ, and raised in a denomination by a large gospel preaching, Bible believing denomination. However, personal studies of the New Testament teaching concerning the church and the ministry led me to question deeply whether many of the traditions and the method of the church were scriptural. At the same time, I was gaining an increasing awareness of these simple assemblies of believers who believed and practiced matched the, the, you know, the conviction that he had and believed uh, uh, the same way that he believed. And he was developing uh, thoughts on this by searching the scriptures. Well, after much praying and agonizing, I felt led by the spirit, he says, uh, to uh, leave the pastor position that he was holding and move on and start meeting with believers who held the same uh, convictions that he had. So uh, he says, I have not once regretted this step, nor can I uh, adequately express how great my family and I, great, 
greatly how my family and I have been blessed by it. I feel it would be both ungrateful and selfish to keep this discovery to myself. Uh, and that was exactly the reason that I decided to do a podcast on this. My convictions have blessed me so much. And by doing what I'm doing has blessed me so much that I want to share it with you. I want to share exactly his thoughts and my thoughts on the principles of gathering. Well, let me just move on a little bit. These assemblies are sometimes referred to as Plymouth Brethren, but he's like me. He just prefers calling them just the Brethren, meaning that we're, we're, every, every Christian has got something in common. We all have the Holy Spirit living within us. And we are just to call each other by the name that God has really given us in his word. They were first called Christians at Antioch. <laughs> and we're all Christians, Christ ones. There's no denominations, there's no names, and we just meet around the Lord. And that's it. Now, the last podcast I did, I... I talked about uh, the Lord's Supper, and that's all part of uh, what we're going to be talking about here. It was back in the early 1800s that the Holy Spirit led uh, some Christians to begin meeting this way. And they were called the Plymouth Brother, and it was because they were in Plymouth, England, uh, and it was a large center for the work. Uh, giving rise to uh, this type of a meeting. Well, even despite the fact that they were called Plymouth Brethren, uh, doesn't mean that uh, we have a denomination. Uh, we're non-denominational. Now, I didn't know this at the time because I wasn't, I wasn't versed in the scriptures. I had not read writings that he speaks of in his uh, writing here. When he mentions names like uh, J.N. Darby, uh, F.W. Grant, H.A. Ironside, William Kelly, C.H. McIntosh, uh, Samuel Redhouse, uh, W.E. Vine, and, and there's many, many more. I had never read these writings, but after I became a Christian and I started meeting, I started reading some of these writings and I really had a hard time reading them for the simple fact that I couldn't even read. I was almost illiterate. I struggled and struggled. And you'll notice that when I try to share things and I read, I'm still not real good at it, but I've come a long ways. And the reason for it is I wanted to understand the word of God. In order to do that, I had to read the Bible. And I would spend six, eight hours a day sitting at my kitchen table, reading the word of God, trying to understand what it said. And it wasn't that I read a lot. It was just that it took me a long time to read what I, the little I did read, and I stumbled. In fact, when I stood up to share in uh, in the meeting, <laughs> praise uh, the believers that I met with, that they were very tolerant with me and understood that I loved the Lord and I wanted to share, but when I started to read, <laughs> They kind of cringed, <laughs> but they were patient and very loving. And I grew uh, in my reading skills, but also in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Now that's kind of my story. 
uh, as I was going through. It is impossible to overestimate the impact these godly and gifted men had on the evangelistic works and the beliefs through the years. And that's true with me too, same as it was with them. I mentioned this not to exalt these men or brethren as a whole, but because one hearing for the first time about these assemblies might mistakenly think that they are another extreme sect or even a cult to be avoided. On the contrary, they have played a key role in the history of Bible-believing Christianity. Over the past two centuries, and they continue to hold without question to the fundamental doctrines of the faith and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death, bodily resurrection, and literal return, salvation through faith alone, and the inspiration of the scriptures, etc. And that's what they believe. That's what I believe. And I'm going to continue to believe it, because there's no other truth. That's the truth. The assemblies are by no means perfect representations of the New Testament Christianity, nor is their history without an imprint of human uh, mistakes and weaknesses, where they have had their share of unfortunate quarrels and divisions. And if you read the history of the assemblies, you're going to see that. There was splits. In fact, the assembly that I go to we had a major split over a doctrine. So we are not exempt from things like this happening. So we can't overlook things like this. Well, he says, since I write the, uh, by, since I write by way of a personal testimony, I do not feel compelled to deal with the systematic way with the beliefs and uh, practices or the principles of the assemblies. Rather, I want to commit uh, or comment on four specific characteristics that I have found uh, particularly noteworthy and refreshing. And these are the four that he says. Elimination of clergy. That was the most important thing in my life. To get rid of the clergy. There's no such thing as clergy and laity. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the Nicolaitan. And I believe that was the first early form of the formation of the clergy. Uh, the uh, Nicolaitan. Nico, I mean, now this is Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar. Nico laity, to conquer the people. That's what it meant. It was probably the first uh, acknowledgement that the clergy was starting in the early church. So that's the first thing that he says. Let me move down here to the second, because I'm not going to go through all this. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, he wrote quite a bit on this that I'm skipping over. Oh, where the heck is the second one here? Uh, let me go back. Maybe I missed it. Uh, come on. Sorry about that. I'm... Well, where the heck it is? Yeah, the elimination of the clergy. All right, let's see if I can find the second thing here. Well, I wish I could pause my video here, but I'm not, I'm in the wrong one here. 
Well, I don't know. I... I'm going to have to scroll down a long ways here to try to find a second one here. Here it is, finally. Obedience to the teaching of the scripture was the second thing that he mentions here. And this uh, concerns the role of the woman in the church. Well, I know he says four things, but this is an important one. And I could do a whole podcast on this alone, uh, the role of the woman in the church. Uh, assemblies are kind of looked down on because of the practices of the new, uh, or I mean of the first century church and the woman's role in the church. They are to be silent talks about head covering. Uh, It talks about submission. And a lot of women look, modern women look down on this. But in reality, if you really think about it, and if we do it God's way, things are so wonderful in the church. It's not downgrading a woman, it's just that she has a different role than a man. You know, in a society that we live in today where men are becoming women and women are becoming men, this is a perversion of the Bible, of the teaching of Scripture. And it's totally against, uh, this is an abomination to the Lord. Well, I'm going to end my podcast here because I'm going to go into a little more detail in my next podcast on the woman's role in the church. And then we'll look at the last two things because he mentions four. So with that said, um, till next time, bye for now.